Good evening. Hi. There's a small enough room that I can yell. Uh, my name is Tas Cochran. I'm the director of neuroethics at the Center for Bioethics. And thank you all for coming to the first neuroethics seminar of 2016. Uh, we've got a great topic that I can tell is of interest to a lot of people. This is a great uh, turnout for us. Uh, the topic is Deception in the Diagnosis and Treatment of Psychogenic Non-Epileptic Seizures, or PNES. Um, as always, our format is that we will uh, have our panelists speak for about an hour or less, and then uh, we'll have another half an hour left for audience participation. We also have dinner planned uh, upstairs. It's an informal sort of dinner. Uh, we haven't been having people RSVP for it because we've always had plenty of food for the number of people. Tonight might be an exception. Um, hopefully there won't be fisticuffs, but it might be first come, first serve when it comes to the food. Everyone's welcome to stay in the room uh, and continue the conversation, but we might not have enough food for everybody if everybody comes. So hang around afterwards if you're interested in continuing to talk or to eat with us. Uh, we've got three panelists uh, tonight, and I'm just going to briefly introduce them and then let them go so that we have as much time as possible. Uh, before I do, I want to thank uh, the Center for Bioethics and our funding support. See if I can get this to go. Uh, we are supported by the Harvard Brain uh, Initiative and the Harvard Mind Brain Behavior Faculty uh, Initiative. Uh, in, in terms of uh, arranging these, and the International Neuroethics Society allows us to uh, webcast this live. So we are on camera, and there, I know for a fact that we've got at least one European viewer, so we're on, we're on around the world. Uh, if you're watching this remotely, please uh, feel free to tweet us questions at HMS, at HMS Bioethics. I'll be monitoring the Twitter feed during the Q&A session. Uh, and if we get a chance and you've got a good question, we'll try and squeeze it in. So uh, please, I encourage you to do that. Uh, so our first speaker tonight uh, is a colleague and friend of mine. Ben Tolchin is a senior epilepsy fellow at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's also currently in the Medical Ethics Fellowship at the Center for Bioethics. Uh, he's a mem an active member of our ethics consultation group uh, at the Brigham. Uh, and so you can, you can see why he's perfectly placed to uh, set up the topic for us tonight. He's also got some funding through the American Academy of Neurology to do some research uh, in an effort to improve the care of patients with psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. Our second speaker comes to us from the University of, uh, Florida, of Southern Florida. Uh, Salim ben Baris is an, uh, a professor of neurology and an epileptologist there. And he is the director of the uh, University of Southern Florida Epilepsy Program, uh, which is a very active uh, program, including uh, performing epilepsy surgeries. And he has uh, written on this topic uh, before, and so we're, I'm definitely looking forward uh, to his thoughts. And then finally, uh, Wes Boyd is a colleague of mine at the Center for Bioethics. Uh, he teaches in the Medical Ethics and Professionalism course uh, at the medical school and in our Master's in Bioethics course. Uh, as well as at the undergraduate campus. Uh, he is a psychiatrist at Cambridge Health Alliance uh, and will give us his thoughts from a, an ethicist's perspective and, but also that of a psychiatrist. So first up, we'll have uh, Ben Tolchin. Thanks. coming. Um, so what I'm going to do is introduce the topic of psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, or PNES. I, know I can see there are some uh, very experienced epileptologists in the audience, but also there are some folks uh, from other areas. And so I'll, I'll try to give a little bit of the background to, to bring everybody up to speed on what this uh, disorder is and, and how we diagnose it. Um, so psychogenic non-epileptic seizures are paroxysmal events involving involuntary movements or alterations in consciousness without associated EEG changes. They're caused by psychological factors, and we think these are most often strong affect or stress that the patient may or may not be aware of. Um, the, uh, they're considered a form of conversion disorder, what is now known as functional neurologic symptom disorders uh, in the new DSM-5. 
Um, the large uh, majority of, of cases of PNAS are thought not to be under the patient's conscious control. They're not consciously produced, though there are rare cases of malingering and factitious disorder in which uh, PNAS are produced for uh, primary or secondary gain. Um, the, the incidence of PNES is, is up to 4 per 100,000 per year. The, the prevalence is up to 33 per 100,000. And to put that in perspective, that's about 5% of the prevalence of epilepsy, about a third of the prevalence of multiple sclerosis. Um, <clears throat> the uh, PNES is, is commonly seen by neurologists, psychiatrists, and uh, emergency physicians. About a third of the admissions to epilepsy monitor, monitoring units uh, across the country are, are ultimately diagnosed with uh, PNES. Um, in the past, uh, the, the dual diagnosis of PNES and epilepsy was thought to be very common. It's, it's probably been quite overstated. People said that the rates were as high as 50% of patients with PNES also had epilepsy. In fact, more recent studies, more rigorous criteria suggest that the uh, the rates are more like 10% of the patients with PNES also have epilepsy. Mm. The, the uh, disability caused by PNES is very real and very substantial. So disability is rated as highly by patients and by their families as is disability caused by epilepsy. Uh, the patients are economically and socially dependent. Most patients cannot drive, cannot work, cannot care for children. Uh, they have frequent emergency department visits, hospital admissions, and they have very high medical care costs. Um, historically, long-term outcomes of PNES have been very poor. So about 75% of patients continue to have psychogenic seizures and the associated disability at five to 10 year follow-up. There's also a slightly increased uh, rate of premature mortality, which is thought to be mediated primarily by uh, low socioeconomic status. Um, there are also rare cases of iatrogenic mortality in cases of PNES. So the best studied uh, form of treatment is um, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, and, and sim similar forms of psychotherapy. Several observational studies and two pilot randomized clinical trials have shown that CBT-based therapy is effective in reducing seizure frequency and improving quality of life in PNES. There are also uh, several observational studies that show uh, improvement in, uh, in uh, these factors with other forms of psychotherapy, including brief psychodynamic psychotherapy and group therapy. Um, psychopharmacological interventions like SSRIs have, are certainly effective in treating psychiatric comorbidities, which are quite common in PNES, but have not been shown to be effective in treating PNES directly. Um, a randomized trial showed that the immediate withdrawal of AEDs or anti-epileptic drugs uh, at the time of diagnosis is more beneficial for patients than uh, a gradual taper off medication. So that's sort of the standard of care at this point. Um, PNES is the single most important differential diagnosis for refractory epilepsy. Um, in one study, 78% of patients with PNES had been previously misdiagnosed uh, with epilepsy and had been treated with at least one anti-epileptic drug. Um, historically, the, the mean time from symptom onset to uh, diagnosis of PNES has been about seven years, uh, although it's thought in, in recent years we're getting better at making that diagnosis more quickly. Um, there, there are elements of the clinical history that do uh, increase the, the likelihood of the diagnosis of PNES uh, in terms of a, of a Bayesian analysis. So for instance, uh, of adult patients diagnosed with PNES, 75% uh, are female, 80% have a history of abuse or trauma, 70% have uh, psychiatric comorbidities, one study uh, showed that a, a history of fibromyalgia or chronic pain in a patient presenting with seizures has a 75% uh, positive predictive value for uh, PNES. Um, but of course, no element of the clinical history is sufficient to make a definite diagnosis of PNES. And in some cases, particularly pediatric cases, the risk factors are quite different. Um, seizure semiology also can provide hints, can increase or decrease the pretest probability of PNES. Seizure semiology is sort of 
what a seizure looks like and what the patient experiences during the seizure. So, um, <clears throat> for example, a uh, eye closing uh, during the seizure or um, intact recall for events that occurred during ictal unresponsiveness and very good um, sensitivity and specificity for PNES. Um, hip uh, pelvic thrusting or horizontal movements of the head or torso have a poor sensitivity but a very good specificity, suggesting PNES. And uh, on average, episodes of PNES tend to uh, be longer in duration and more frequent uh, than episodes of uh, epileptic seizures. Um, nonetheless, the, when, when experienced neurologists are shown videos of psychogenic and epileptic uh, seizures and asked to distinguish between the two, their accuracy is only 67 to 80% uh, when just reviewing the seizure semiology without seeing EEG data. So ultimately, clinical history and um, semiology uh, in combination with an interictal routine EEG can make a diagnosis of probable PNES. But to make a definite diagnosis of documented <coughs> PNES requires video EEG capture of all the patient's typical episodes with uh, showing that there is no EEG change during the episodes and ideally showing that there is a normal waking background before, during, and after uh, each typical episode. Uh, important caveats are focal uh, seizures without discognitive effects, what was formerly known as simple partial seizures, and uh, frontal lobe seizures, both of which can occur without any um, epileptiform abnormalities on surface EEG. In order to, to make this diagnosis, what is usually required is an admission to uh, an epilepsy monitoring unit in a tertiary care medical center for uh, prolonged video EEG monitoring over, on average, four to five days. Um, and what's done there is the uh, seizure medication is <coughs> drawn, and the patient is monitored closely until they have their typical events. And then the events are analyzed by experienced epileptologists uh, to evaluate whether there is any EEG change correlating with the events. So. Uh, a, a typical event that we'll, we'll use to sort of illustrate this process is, is that of Ms. W, um, who, who recently presented to our uh, center. This is a real case. Um, so Ms. W, is a, she's a 27-year-old lady uh, who has a history of depression, anxiety, and uh, severe obesity, um, status post a uh, gastric bypass in June of 2015. Uh, we presented with a year of convulsive episodes. Um, so she was, um, her events are, are currently happening about once to twice per week, and they, um, they consist of a sudden loss of consciousness uh, from wakefulness uh, with uh, stiffening and bilateral arm and leg shaking uh, associated with moans and grunts and sometimes with striking of the bilateral arms against her uh, chest and head. Um, there is postictal confusion. Uh, the, the event itself lasts about two minutes, and then there will be uh, 15 to 30 minutes of, of confusion. Uh, there is no tongue biting or urinary incontinence. Um, when and the patient herself has no memory of these events, uh, in terms of uh, risk factors for epilepsy, she does have a family history. Her mother has multiple sclerosis and did have a seizure when, she, when the mother was 13 was treated with phenobarbital for a year and then taken off. Um, when asked about stressors, the patient reports that she's been having increasing difficulty uh, maintaining her, her diet and exercise regimen for her gastric bypass. So she was uh, seen at, uh, by an outside uh, neurologist. She got, had a neuro exam that was reportedly normal, an MRI that, of the brain, which was normal, and a routine EEG that was uh, normal. And she was started on levetiracetam, an anti-seizure medication, which was repeatedly uptitrated for <coughs> ongoing convulsive episodes. And then she was switched over to lamotrigine, another seizure medication, for, uh, without any improvement in the convulsive episodes. And at that point, she was referred to our epilepsy center. Um, when she came to us, she was quickly uh, brought into the epilepsy monitoring unit and uh, tapered off of lamotrigine. Um, after 48 hours in the epilepsy monitoring unit, she uh, had had none of her typical episodes. Her 
uh, her EEG at that point showed no definite abnormalities. She did report that she was having some episodes of bilateral leg paresthesias, but none of the convulsive episodes that she was being evaluated for. Um, and so the, uh, the question is, 48 hours into this, um, uh, this, this long-term evaluation, what, uh, what is the next step? Yes, uh, we'll discuss that issue. So we're going to take care of Ms. W. <laughs> so thank you for having me, first of all. It's only the second time that I speak here. The last time was a year ago, and both times, thanks to my colleague Barbara for speech. So thank you for inviting me. And you have a daughter in Boston. Hopefully you and I have a daughter. Talk to university for you with that. So let's take care of Miss W. As you heard, these were very important points, and I'm going to highlight a few that, that you already made. This is common. This is disabling, and it can be treated. So th those are three arguments why making the diagnosis is so important. You know, in neurology, especially 100 years ago, we had the reputation that we diagnose and then we do nothing. <laughs> That has changed, and for many things we can treat. So now the importance of making accurate diagnoses are even more uh, highlighted. So this discussion is not new. I've had this discussion in writing a few times. This is uh, 2001 with our uh, late colleague John Gates. There's always been a little bit of controversy about whether or not we should use activation protocols. This was again in 2009 with a younger counterpart. And uh, in my view, they lost the argument both times, but of course I'm biased. <laughs> and I will show you why. There are several recent papers on the topic. There are many. This is a recent one that I like. It summarizes the different ways of doing inductions. So there's a lot written on the topic, uh, and I will cite uh, some of it. So the diagnosis, as you heard, is typically suspected clinically, as in Ms. W, but can only be made confidently and definitely with EEG video recording that records the episodes in question. Here's what I meant by the importance of making the diagnosis. We know that the average delay for diagnosis right now is seven to 10 years. This is studies in the US or, or advanced countries that have EEG video monitoring. It is not an accessibility issue like when you go give a lecture in uh, Mexico or in rural uh, Chile. This is in places where we have the equipment, we have the capability. It's more of a culture and a, an attitude of physicians that causes the delay. And typically, the, the delay causes the patients to take multiple medications, undergo multiple procedures, go to the ER, not get the right treatment. And we know that the prognosis with treatment is worse if the wrong diagnosis has been perpetuated for longer. So we're talking about induction uh, methods. The, the basic principles of induction is to trigger an episode when none occurs spontaneously, as in Ms. W. If you let her go after 48 hours, which are expensive, by the way, 48 hours of inpatient EG video, you let her go, you have no diagnosis. She goes home, she continues to take the lamotrigine and levator acid for another seven to 10 years, maybe. Now, you could keep her longer, which we try to do, but insurance calls and now an hour back too because they want the patient discharged. So there is a real economic argument here, practical argument, to try to make a seizure happen so we can get the diagnosis. In addition, as I will show you, that's the main reason for doing induction. But there is another reason, and I will show you, because that one is not often mentioned. It strengthens the diagnosis for patients who need the diagnosis to be a little stronger. It's, it's an added argument for the diagnosis of psychogenic episodes. Um, as I said, there are many ways to do this, some with placebo, some without, and you, you've seen this and you've read about it. The, the classic old one is the IV placebo, and we have shied away from this because ethically it is the most problematic. There is something semi-invasive about injecting something, even if it's normal saline, in somebody's vein. Uh, and we have also largely, and most centers have abandoned other things like patch, tuning fork, and things that are really a little crazy looking. And what we do most often now, and my understanding is that that is what most centers do, is use procedures that we use in a regular EEG, which is hyperventilation, photic stimulation, and a little bit of verbal coaching. There are advantages in doing those because the yield is the same as using IV placebo or corky maneuvers. And it doesn't raise suspicions. You don't have to deceive as much because these procedures are done on everybody to induce a seizure. And that's the truth. 
So the deception is minimized when you use hyperventilation, photic stimulation, and verbal suggestion as opposed to a placebo. So just to uh, drive the point that you heard, these are dramatic. These are severe episodes. I think when you see these, you will understand these people can't drive a car. This is truly disabling. Whether it's epileptic or psychogenic, these are disabling. You will also notice some of these cold ash patients are having it triggered by flashing lights. Not all of them. Sometimes it occurs spontaneously. But this is how we make a diagnosis. If Miss W could have her typical episode like this in the monitoring unit with good video, good EEG, we can make a nearly certain diagnosis, nearly 100% accurate diagnosis. How often can we say that in neurology or in medicine for that matter? So I would argue that depriving ourselves of a method that helps us get 100% certainty when we make a diagnosis is not good practice. Now, we don't always need to do it, as I will show you. It needs to be done in patients or for patients in whom it helps. It adds something. These are patients who did not have an episode spontaneously. Otherwise, we don't do it. If Ms. W had an episode in the first 12 hours and I have a diagnosis, I don't have to do an induction. We don't do it for the fun of it. We do it if it adds to taking care of the patient and getting a proper diagnosis. But I'm showing you this for those of you who don't see this every day, that these are severe. These patients cannot function. So getting a right diagnosis so we can get them the right treatment is important. So they are, most of the time, the diagnosis with EEG video is clear. These are easy cases that I showed you. It's not always like that. I showed you somewhere there wouldn't be much controversy in my ecologist about the diagnosis. It's not always like that. Like everything else, there are patients that are more difficult. Patients who have more than one type of events, for example, you have to be very careful that we can only conclude as to the nature of the episode we recorded. Very important. It's a common cause of error. Theoretically, also, remember when we induce an episode or not, and we record an episode with EEG video, we can conclude with the absence of any EEG discharge, enterically and ectally, that the episode is not epileptic. Not epileptic does not necessarily mean psychogenic. The reality, as you mentioned, is that most of the time it is. But it's not synonymous. There's another step. So to, make, to go the next step and say it's psychogenic, we need to analyze the phenomenology of the episode. That means the video, the semiology, meaning that it's not a syncope, it's not a TIA, it's not Parkinson's disease, it's not essential tremor, it's not narcolepsy, etc. We have to act as neurologists. And of course, the neuropsychological profile, including suggestibility. This is what I meant when I said the positive induction by itself strengthens the suspicion that this is psychogenic. Not just non-epileptic, psychogenic. Other pitfalls of EEG video you touched on very nicely. Simple partial seizures, we know what they are, but some seizures do not cause EEG changes ectally. We know what they are, so we are careful. Again, you have to interpret the EEG in the context of the video and vice versa. Also, as I will show you, seizures when they are violent can, can completely obscure the EEG. The EEG becomes useless. So these, the first two here, are two scenarios in which the EEG part of EEG video is useless worth nothing. And that's when inductions come. Because then it, it's another argument. I lost the EEG, either because it shows no change, because in that type of seizure it doesn't, or it's obscured. The induction, in addition to triggering an episode, gives you a supplementary argument to say that it is psychogenic. So, just to review. The main use of inductions is like Miss W, to induce an episode if she doesn't have one spontaneously. So it increases the yield of the EEG video when no spontaneous events are recorded. What that means is it turns, in somebody like Ms. W, it turns an evaluation that would have been useless, inconclusive, we can only say we didn't record nothing, I don't have a diagnosis, continue to take your seizure medications. It turns that into a conclusive evaluation. I think that is worth it. That's my argument. Also, it means that we can make diagnoses in patients who have events that are not very frequent, but if they are suggestible, I can obtain a diagnosis by doing a one-hour study, a one-hour EEG video. No need for 24 hours, 48 hours, three days, four days. Very expensive. Insurance doesn't like it. They don't approve it half the time. One hour, outpatient. Done properly if the patient is suggestible. In one hour, I trigger the episode with the caveats we mentioned, including the very important one, that what we just induced is what she is doing at home. You've got to have that discussion with the family. Confirm that. But with that, 
the yield of this, we have two <coughs> studies on this, as you can see. It's the same as EEG video. It doesn't matter if the patient is monitored for three days or for two hours, if I can record the habitual episode. So this is a very practical, it makes patients that would be otherwise undiagnosable, because they have rare events, it makes them now obtain a clear diagnosis. It's also useful inductions when you have to give extra convincing arguments. Some people are difficult to convince that this is psychogenic. Sometimes it's patients, sometimes it's families, sometimes it's attorneys, and sometimes, often, it's psychiatrists. They tend to not believe that very much. But if I can show them that I induce this with a placebo, maybe I can sway a few and make them believe the diagnosis. Many of them still don't. Now, I showed you easy cases. Here are some difficult ones. Is this psychogenic or is this a simple partial seizure, simple partial motor seizure? And the reason I show this and the reason this is difficult is if this is a simple partial motor seizure, focal motor seizure, oftentimes this type of seizure is the type that does not produce changes on the EEG ictally. So if I record this with the most beautiful EEG and the EEG shows nothing, I cannot, based on that alone, conclude that it is psychogenic. I have lost the EEG. It's one of the scenarios I mentioned earlier where you lose the EEG. The EEG is useless. Now, if she's thrashing on both sides and has a normal EEG, we can all conclude. But if she has minor heat, essentially heat, a minor shaking of one limb like that, or like this one, unilateral, limited physically, the normal EEG by itself does not help us say that it is psychogenic. On the other hand, if I tell you that I induced five of these consistently with photic stimulation or IV placebo, I think most of us would agree it suggests that they are psychogenic. So that's what I mean when I said in addition to increasing the yield of the patient who doesn't have a spontaneous event, it brings an additional argument. Again, often we don't need that additional argument, and then I recommend that we don't use induction. But sometimes, in addition to increasing the yield, it increases our diagnostic ability. Here's another one. And after having monitored these many times, I still don't know what he has. <laughs> so that is difficult. I do not think these are <coughs> epileptic, based on multiple monitoring of this. But I cannot go beyond. I say these are not epileptic. I don't know if they are psychogenic or if they are organic, as in a movement disorder, dystonia, other movement disorders. If I told you, it didn't happen, but if I told you that I induced these with IV saline six times, that would be helpful. It didn't happen with it, so I still don't know. But that's a scenario where it would, the, the placebo response by itself is an additional diagnostic argument. This is what I mean by obscurity EG. So sometimes EG looks like this. Again, I have lost half of my test of the EG video. The video is invaluable. It's wonderful to have those videos. But I don't have the EG. So if the diagnosis is easy, good. I don't need anything else. If the diagnosis is difficult, I submit to you that induction will give me another means of obtaining a right diagnosis. So I say the advantages are that it increases the yield and that it's very highly specific. If I can induce an episode, preferably the, the uh, habitual episode, with a placebo, whether it's IV saline, tuning fork, which we don't like, as I said, or simply hyperventilation, photic stimulation, if I can induce it with that, it's a strong argument to say that it's psychogenic. Contrary to what psychiatrists sometimes think and write, there is no false positives. They often say, oh, but you might induce an epileptic seizure. So what? If I do, I know the patient has epilepsy. So it's helpful. So th th this false positive fallacy does not cut it. Uh, so the, the, the psychogenicity, if you will, the inducibility, will help differentiate a non-epileptic event between psychogenic non-epileptic or organic non-epileptic, which we see also. Most common are syncope, TIA, movement disorders, or sleep disorders, for example. So sometimes in those scenarios, as I showed you example, the response to placebo, or to inductions, I should say, is the strongest diagnostic argument because the EEG is useless, the simple partial motor seizure or the EEG obscure. So are there disadvantages? Do people who oppose inductions have a point? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> is there an ethical concern? Yes, a little. There is non-disclosure. <laughs> no question there is non-disclosure, at least initially. Uh, but they, they, 
the whole school of thoughts that we shouldn't do this is because, oh, it might damage the doctor relationship and the trust, and these patients have been abused in the past. And, and as I've written before, and I will say it again, I think this is a nice discussion for philosophy classes. But I worked in the real world with real patients. As you heard, this is a third of what we monitor in patients with difficult seizures. And you are not going to take away a tool that helps me make a right diagnosis. Uh, it is much worse. The deception is much worse with a placebo, which is why we have shied away, as I said, from IV placebo. We hardly ever use those anymore. But when we do routine, regular EEG procedures, everybody, everybody that gets an EEG gets hyperventilation, photic stimulation, and a little encouragement. So when we do that, we are being honest. We are trying to trigger a seizure of some kind. The false positive argument, which is, well, you might trigger an episode simply because the patient is suggestible, which many people are. It doesn't mean her episodes are psychogenic. The cure to that is to spend 15 minutes after the fact discussing with the patient and the family, was this the habitual event, yes or no? <laughs> if you induce something different, you do have to be careful, because that's a, re it's a reason for errors. Is it harmful? So this is what I mentioned earlier. Uh, the, the arguments that it's harmful is that the damaging to the doctor-patient relationship, and they've been abused before, and, uh, uh, I don't like it. <laughs> maybe, that's all maybe, and it's theoretical. What I'm telling you about the practicality, that's every day. I, th those are facts. This is philosophy. Maybe they have a slight point. And by the way, there are two studies that I showed you here where patients were specifically asked after the activation, one was with verbal and the other one not, if they felt that it was harmful, and in both studies they didn't. And that's my experience also. It is worth it when you consider everything else that we have discussed. Seven to ten year delay, taking three anti-epileptic drugs, this poor Miss W is taking two of them. These medications aren't benign. So yes, there is some deception, but it's not harmful in a practical way. Theoretically, yes, you know, psychiatrists like philosophy. Perpetuating a wrong diagnosis of epilepsy has a lot of consequences, and they are listed here. These patients go to, from the ER to get another ER. Some of them end up in ICU intubated. They take multiple anti-epileptic drugs. This is very costly to society, uh, and we know that the prognosis is worse over time. And again, with regular EG procedures, not IV placebo, there is a way to do that ethically. So it absolutely can be done ethically. We use it only when necessary. As I said, when Miss W has two episodes in the first two days, I have a diagnosis, we're happy with this. She doesn't need an induction. We don't do it for the fun of it. As uh, Oren Davinsky mentioned in one of his papers that I referenced, you tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Even after the fact, you debrief if they ask, and you tell the truth, which is where it becomes a lot easier if you didn't use IV saline. Because with IV saline, there really is deception. And that's why most centers don't use it anymore. But I have no problem saying that we do activation procedure, hyperventilation, photic stimulation, and verbal suggestion because it induces some type of seizure, and that's what we want to see. So, is it ethical? I think you know my position by now. <laughs> yes, I think it is very ethical. And those are the four principles that you all are very familiar with. It does promote the best interest of the patient. It absolutely does no harm. The only alleged harm is theoretical, not practical. Whereas the side effects of the perpetuating diagnosis, those are real. Medications, ICU, there is a case or two of death in ICU because they receive propofol and adamant and bursad and all kinds of things. The lack of trust in the doctor-patient uh, relationship doesn't kill anybody to my knowledge. It acts fairly with respect to different individuals or groups. This is an interesting one. This has to do with the cost. We waste so much money. Get another MRI. Monitor her for another six days. So much money when we could have done be done with this and get a diagnosis. The only slight point, again, I will grant them that, that the objection people have, <laughs> yes, it does violate the autonomy a little. For a few minutes, yes, we violate the autonomy. <laughs> I am so sorry. <laughs> but I'm say, sparing you 10 more years of dilantin and tegretol. So yes, there is some deception, but I think, in my view, it is well worth it, and the advantages far outweigh the benefits, far outweigh the disadvantages. So, just to conclude and to put it in perspective, I think this is ethical. Let me tell you what is unethical that we see every day. We do have things that are unethical. And I, I saw one on TV recently. So first, I'll repeat it again, perpetuating the wrong diagnosis for obvious reasons we discussed is unethical. Secondly, 
the assumption that psychogenic means faking, which I'm sure in this audience is not there, but if you practice in the real world, not the world in which psychiatrists and philosophers live, in the real world, people mistake psychogenic for faking. And in fact, I was watching TV last week, and I happened to stumble on the untold stories of the ER, and they had a case of a pseudo-seizure. I don't know if they were lucky enough to see it. They induced with saline, by the way. Uh, allegedly, that was accidental. The doctor didn't know. They gave him a saline uh, syringe by mistake. That was the story. <laughs> but anyway, in retrospect, he said, well, that's helpful. There was a mistake, but it's helpful. That means that these are pseudo-seizures, and I'm going to explain it to the patient. He goes to the patient, and he explains to them that these, you are faking your seizures. This is on the TV show, which I assume this doctor represents the authority. This is the guy who nailed it. Good, good, good doctor. Even he thinks that men faking. So that's that kind of misunderstanding and basically an accusation, which is what faking is, is unethical. Now I'll give you my favorite unethical thing in the world of epilepsy, and that is the fact that the mental health professionals are not helpful. This is a psychiatric disease. It's part of conversion disorder, or now called something else, somatic symptom disorder or functional disorder. I don't love that term. Regardless of what it's called, it's in the DSM, and I didn't put it in there. It's there, because it's a psychiatric disease. It's not dermatology, and it's not gynecology. It is psychiatry. And the problem is that the psychiatry and psychology community are showing very little interest in this, and I've presented this many times at the APA. But I went to many meetings looking for research at the American Psychiatric Association, a huge organization, very powerful. They have a national meeting with thousands of psychiatrists running around. And look at the proportion of research they have on this topic. Now that is unethical. By the way, the American Psychological Association, uh, no, this is another APA meeting, so these are several samples. This is the most recent I went to, then I stopped because they were not improving. 2012, same thing. There is zero, nothing. You should look at the proportion. 300 pages, 589 abstracts. These are the number of abstracts, research on this, this broad topic of somatic symptom or functional disorders. That's the research part. Here's the patient education part. This is from the APA. This is the last time I checked. Please, please go check tomorrow and prove me wrong. And now they have patient information on this, but I doubt it. This is the American Psychiatric Association. Patient information. Look at the topics. You find me something remotely related to somatization, somatoform conversion, somatoform disorder, etc. There is nothing. This is the American Psychological Association, and they are no better. So how the APAs can hide from this and let us neurologists who are not trained to deal with these patients for treatment, we can diagnose, all right, but I can't do psychotherapy. I don't want to do psychotherapy. That is much more ethical than doing induction. And that is my view, which you can read more in these articles that I think I've supplied earlier. So, I think there is deception, but it is minimal, and the benefits far outweigh the ethical objections, which in my view are largely theoretical, whereas the downsides of not getting a diagnosis are not theoretical. Those are very real, and we see them every day. Thank you very much. Hopefully, I didn't go over time. Inspiring, and uh, <laughs> glad to know that you have a definite point of view. There were just a couple of places there. I was wondering if you were actually going to say what you thought. <laughs> so, uh, I'll be back. Yeah, and, and uh, yes, you will. I'm sure. Uh, and now I have to say uh, that uh, the uh, my undergraduate educate. I, I was announced as a psychiatrist, as you all know, but uh, my uh, undergraduate and master's degrees were in philosophy, so I <laughs> attended a lot of philosophy classes. Um, but uh, will not ever uh, identify very much with the APA. So you can swing away at the AP all you, APA all you want. I have many of my own objections with both the American Psychiatric and the American Psychological. Um, first, uh, getting into this, I want to say thanks to Taz for asking me to participate. I'm delighted to be here. Um, my wife today said, uh, why are you speaking uh, on a topic uh, a neuro neurology topic, although I understand that treatment should be focused in psychiatry. 
And I said, I'm not exactly sure, truthfully. Uh, I think I'm supposed to be like the color commentator. And uh, she said, this is a quote, don't say anything outrageous. <laughs> she said, you just got the job. That would be with Christine in bioethics. And the checks are clearing. <laughs> don't mess it up like you often do. So I'm going to, that's what she said. Um, and also, by way of confession, uh, I'll say that um, until Toss asked me to, to participate in this panel, uh, I have thought very little about psychogenic seizures, truthfully. I have one patient right now who I'm seeing psychiatrically uh, because she has a multitude of problems, certainly some of which contribute to her psychogenic seizures. Um, but I had not really given thought, probably since medical school, about how to make the diagnosis, distinguish the diagnosis, and so on. So I say that uh, as a confession that I have just come into thinking about this recently. Um, uh, the role of deception and, and other issues, even making the diagnosis. And also, uh, starting over the last week, I actually is, uh, started doing a lot of reading about uh, psychogenic seizures, deception, diagnosis, and so on. The reason it really started about a week ago is that's when the last class I taught in January ended, and I was teaching 11 hours a week in class. Some of the students are here and can vouch for that. Um, uh, and so as we're walking out of bioethics last Thursday, one of the other um, ethics teachers, uh, Steve Brown, a radiologist at Children's Hospital, and I were walking out, and he said, hey, I saw you on that poster, you know, how are you going to come down? What do you think? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. He goes, come on, you know, you know what you're going to say, don't you? And I said, no, I, I honestly don't know. And so that, you know, as of uh, a week ago, I didn't know where I was going to come down. Um, I've since done a lot of reading. Uh, on the topic, as I said, I have to give a shout out to Babu Krishnamurthy, uh, student last semester, colleague uh, at HMS otherwise, uh, for talking me off the ledge. We were on the phone, and she didn't realize I actually was standing on a window ledge, thinking, if I just jump, I won't have to be here today. <laughs> Somehow she got me right off that ledge. She's a neurologist, not a psychiatrist. Um, I was not on a ledge, for the record. Um, uh, and I also realize this is somewhat of a controversy uh, in neurology. It's not as big as I had thought. I sort of ran by you know, the extent of this controversy um, in neurology. Certainly, it sounds like it's a fairly uh, debated issue for epileptologists uh, and those working in the field otherwise. Um, and so what I'm about to say, and I'll actually get to the substantive comments around now, um, I will offer these comments as a starting point for a dialogue. I actually philosophically believe, I am mean, hesitant to say anything about philosophy, but one of my philosophical convictions is if there's any approaching truth on any particular issue, it has to come through dialogue as opposed to monologue. So I'll offer these as a start, starting, uh, starting uh, thoughts about engaging in dialogue. Um, the, the long story short is the more I read about um, deception and making diagnoses and thinking about my work with my own patients, and I see a ton of patients, uh, all adult for the most part, uh, across the socioeconomic spectrum, uh, I, I don't think that I can stand by and justify deception, even if it is a brief deception uh, for, you know, that's going to be revealed in a pretty short order um, in this context. Um, and even if there's debriefing and, and so on. Um, several general points. Uh, absolutely, I, we would all agree, I think, that if we could get to a, an accurate diagnosis uh, as quickly as possible of neurogenic, uh, psychogenic seizures or uh, epileptic seizures, we would all agree that the quicker we get to that diagnosis, the better. I think that's just sort of a, a straight, probably a statement of fact, I hope it is. All, all other things being equal. Um, also, we heard the figure 78% of, of individuals with PNES um, receive anti-seizure medications uh, at some point uh, over the course of their uh, treatment. Um, that also very much scares me. I am exceedingly leery of uh, pharmaceutical industry generally. I prescribe meds all of the time. I do it with uh, trepidation and fear and respect for potential side effects. So the fact that 
uh, people with PNES are receiving medications, pr presumably and possibly for long periods of time, I think that's a, a very bad thing. Uh, and anything we can reasonably do to decrease that would be a, uh, also something good. Um, but, and this gets to uh, some of uh, the comments uh, just before, I feel like uh, psychic pain is real and um, it has to be respected. And I don't think that uh, to say that if someone is uh, experiencing pain or feeling uh, let down or feeling angry as a result of having been um, deceived and again deceived for a good reason I don't want I don't want anyone to take any remark I make uh, to say the deceptions entirely unjustified or it's all about you know abusing the patients nothing like that I mean it's a difference of opinion I think about what is in the patient's best interest um, but I just have to put out there as a psychiatrist that psychic pain is real it's got to be respected and if you want to put dollars and cents on it, major depression is probably one of the most expensive uh, illnesses in this country in terms of not just its treatment, but the indirect downstream costs, missed work, uh, doctor's visits, you name it. Um, so the costs of the medical si uh, system are actually quite huge for a lot of psychiatric illness. Um, and um, the other thing is, just uh, for those of us who have sat with patients in, in you know, great distress and pain, I've heard it more than once that psychiatric patients have said, you know, I don't have any outward sign of my psychiatric illness. Sometimes I just wish I could wear like a, an ace bandage around my head so that people would know something was wrong with me. You know, if people get a broken arm or they get, they get to wear a cast, you know, there's nothing like that for us. So there's a lot of distress and it, and it really, I think what that's, that sentiment among some of my patients says is that it hurts when the psychiatric component is not recognized. Um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I, in, in the reading I did, and uh, again, I've come into this quite recently, I have a couple of questions about the efficacy of uh, the provocative techniques uh, with or without the use, use of deception. Um, to state uh, what I think is pretty uh, straightforward, uh, there, there is an overlap of patients uh, who both have psychogenic seizures and epileptic seizures. The figure we heard was about 10%. Um, and so if provocative techniques, again, whether or not you're using deception, if provocative techniques actually cause seizure activity physically, but there are no EEG findings, that certainly generally would confirm a diagnosis of psychogenic seizures. But confirming that diagnosis uh, does not in any way rule out the possibility that this same individual might also have epileptic seizures. And so, you know, nailing one part of a, of what, of a diagnosis uh, would be very important if we knew it were the only part, but if uh, this is one of those individuals where they're having both types of seizure activity, you know, uh, honing in on one diagnosis is not enough um, in and of itself. Um, the other thing is, uh, if, if provocative techniques do not produce convulsions in any single individual, um, then this obviously does not rule out that they might not have PNES, right? So in any, any provocative technique, with or without, without saline injections or, and so on, um, um, if someone does have PNES, they are not necessarily going to respond to the provocative techniques. Um, one study I, I saw quoted, uh, and I have all the references buried because I thought if I'm sitting in front of a bunch of neurologists and I'm new to the topic, uh, very new in fact, I'm going to make sure I've got references to support at least any statistical things I say. Uh, one study in 2006 found that of individuals known to have psychogenic seizures, 32% had no response when infused with saline. 32%, no response. Um, and so if we didn't know that they had already had, already were diagnosed with psychogenic seizures, we might conclude they don't have them, which would be false. Another study found that 40% of those with psychogenic seizures uh, had no response to a, a saline infusion. Um, some of the numbers I see quoted are lower than those, but regardless, uh, the point remains that um, the non-response rates can be uh, high 
and in fact certainly complicate matters. Um, and then the other thing is the high false positive rate. Um, I'll say this, uh, one study found 23% of those with psychogenic seizures had responses unlike their usual events. And if it's unlike your usual events, you can't necessarily chalk it up to uh, psychogenic seizure. Another researcher, uh, this is a quote, the number of false positives in our group was too high. And yet another researcher said that because of the high false positive rates of these <coughs> provocative techniques, a psychological evaluation might be more readily used to identify uh, psychogenic seizures. Um, in other words, let's drop the provocative techniques and uh, go more along the psychiatric end, end of things to render the diagnosis. And then finally, I saw this study quoted uh, at least once if not twice. I could not pull the original paper, so this is secondhand, not firsthand. I tried several times, Google Scholar, you know, the Harvard libraries, I, I couldn't get it. But uh, in a 1996 study, they said the most common reason for not employing provocative techniques in trying to make these determinations and diagnoses was not ethical concerns. It was lack of uh, test reliability. So that was what they said was the, the biggest reason, at least in that survey in 1996, that provocative techniques were not being used. So that this, I think, speaks to efficacy and the ability to hone in on uh, a diagnosis, if not several diagnoses. And in fact, I did see um, uh, in one place that, you know, some individuals who had been deceived in um, uh, receiving these tech the pro provocative techniques, some had said yes, it was okay once they were debriefed. But uh, a couple of other studies said that the most common side effects of provocative techniques were dizziness, uh, anger, and difficulty accepting the diagnosis. Um, Along those, and, and you can, I think dizziness might be, they, they didn't, I don't recall if they said these were people who got saline infusions, but certainly people can get uh, queasy when they see an IV line going in. Um, anger, I think, is probably pretty straightforward. Uh, a lot of people would be angry, uh, understandably, if they feel like they had been deceived in some way. Uh, and also, you know, I think that the same idea follows with the difficulty accepting procedures. Um, I would say, and actually I go a little further, I would say that if a particular study uh, found that most patients are okay after the fact with having been deceived, that I would at least wonder about the study design, um, I would wonder about the questions that were asked, and I would wonder about the motivation of the authors of that study, because we all know that study design, the questions we ask, and our own motivations can certainly influence the findings that we get. And so that's just something I keep in mind when I would see anything that says, oh yes, most patients found it fine, or, or the converse. Um, and then finally, the other thing I would say is, even if patients did in fact say, after the fact, yes, I'm fine that I was deceived, my feeling is that does not make it ethically or morally acceptable. I, I say this, I mean I could give about a thousand analogies, but a very obvious one is, I would wager you could ask women around the world in oppressive either religious uh, or political environments where they essentially are deprived of rights, and ask a lot of those women, are you okay? Do you feel okay that you, your status is what it is and you're not able to you know, dress in certain ways, leave the house at certain times, have jobs, get education, etc. And I would wager that a, a, a lot of women, I wouldn't say majority, I've never done the study, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of women said, oh yeah, I'm fine with it. And I would have to come back and say, in fact, I think that's not quite right. Um, so sometimes we're wrong about our own motivations and thoughts. Um, I think one uh, very reasonable um, aspect of Dr. Ben Badi's, uh position is the inherent question that you're asking in, in the work, which is, have we gone too far in trying to respect autonomy? In other words, should we have informed consent and autonomy be the most precious values, sort of, and uh, utilitarian arguments be secondary? Uh, and I think your very strong position is, uh, no, the utility of, of using these techniques is such that uh, it outweighs and it should outweigh, and it's in fact ethically uh, advisable to, out, 
to have it outweigh concerns about patient autonomy. Um, I'll just leave that out there right now, but I think that's one of the underlying uh, difficulties, or at least the um, underlying uh, differences that uh, some might have if they're putting patient autonomy first as opposed to what works and that and, and, and if it works, obviously that also is in the patient's interest, but I'll just put that out there. Um, I also can't help but think about patients, uh, and, uh, patients who are coming in with psychogenic seizures. Um, as in many, many instances, our patients are dramatically uh, disempowered. Um, there is a power dynamic at play. I would say any time uh, a patient and a doctor are meeting, I think the doctors you know, have the power, <coughs> patients are somewhat disempowered. I even feel disempowered, believe it or not, I've been around these parts for a while. If I go to my primary care doctor, uh, as soon as I check in, they say sit in the waiting area. I, I'm at their mercy to an extent. I mean, that's just to get in to see the doctor, much less what, what might happen when I go into a room. Um, and, and if I'm feeling disempowered, I can imagine that a lot of our patients feel a lot of um, discrepancy between where they see themselves along these lines versus their doctors. Um, also, uh, many patients with psychogenic seizures have uh, lots and lots of doctor's appointments, and just imagine you know, one appointment after another after another where you are uh, feeling like the doctor's up here and I'm down there. Um, and additionally, uh, just as appears to be the case in psychiatry, there is a lot of stigma for patients uh, with seizure disorders and or with uh, psychogenic seizures. And uh, it seems that a lot of patients can come to define themselves through their illness. Uh, and that's an added level of, of um, difficulty for patients. Given all these difficulties, they're being disempowered. I think adding deception on top of a treatment regimen is a little bit like piling on in football in the sense that um, you know these people are down they definitely need our help I know people want to offer help by getting the right diagnosis as quickly as possible I just happen to think right now this isn't the way to do it um, and then the other thing is that a lot of the patients and we got a little glimpse of this before a lot of patients with pseudogenic seizures have trauma histories uh, they're predominantly female uh, many of them were uh, sexually abused when they were young, often by someone they were likely supposed to be able to trust, a family member, a, an adult neighbor, something like that. Um, and additionally, uh, most of my patients, I mean, one of my standard teaching lines is, most of my patients have been told that they neither count nor matter. That's what the world has told them from the time they were born, and my response to that an effort to counteract it to whatever small degree that might be possible is to treat them with respect and actually you know, sit across from them and be engaged with them and want to hear what they have to say. Um, so with that said, if we're thinking about a saline infusion, and, and I'm glad to hear they're, they're, not, they're definitely on the wane, let's say, but if you're talking about a saline infusion and in the provocative technique in order to render a diagnosis, MD is going to be, at least initially, lying to the patient or heavily obfuscated. The patient is, I mean, the doctor is going to be inserting a foreign object under the skin of the patient and then, after that, infusing a liquid. You don't have to be a uh, Sigmund Freud or a heavy psychoanalytic uh, anal type therapist to hear that in some ways that is recapitulating the trauma. And then if you, if once all of that is removed, and then you say, oh yeah, by the way, I was, I, you know, for good reason, for your health, I was deceiving you, I, I, I don't see that. I think the more, more metaphorical implications can cause actual real trauma, uh, not sort of philosophical trauma, not pie in the sky trauma, but people who are dejected and may uh, have difficulty engaging further with medical care. Um, and even if there's no saline, um, to the pain and, and suffering of the loss of the psychiatrist, or I'm sorry, the loss of the trust in the physician, I think also could be pretty large. Um, so in terms of possible harms, uh, I've said some. Uh, I think one harm for patients is uh, the sense of, the further sense that he or, he or she does not matter. Because look, you know, I'm not even above being lied to by physicians, and they're the ones who are supposed to be telling me the truth. 
anger and betrayal, traumatizing or re-traumatizing the patient, the patient coming to not trust physicians, I think, is also a potential downstream effect, and the public not trusting um, physicians. If the public starts hearing, oh yeah, I go to a doctor's office, they may or may not do these things to me, or they're deceiving me, well, where, where, you know, are you deceiving me when you tell me that one milligram of Ativan is going to make me a little calmer when I give this talk, you know, or something like that. Uh, uh, and then I think for physicians also, if we engage in deception, I think there's a certain amount of strain on us anytime we engage in, in lies. And there have been several times in my, li in my life where I have engaged in sustained uh, deception, and I'm not going into the details, but that, that, and this isn't sustained, I understand it's short-lived, but it, being a deceiver is costly. It is, it is difficult and it exacts a toll on us. I'll just leave it at that. And then finally, how would you even operationalize uh, the position that it is okay to uh, deceive, uh, deceive patients? As a, a teacher, both of medical students and residents, one of my policies that I realized as I was you know, thinking about this over the last week is, is I say out loud to anyone who listens, including patients, my policy is not to lie to patients. And I've gotten there partly for their benefit and partly for my benefit. Um, but it's taken me years to actually start saying that out loud. Um, and I've probably violated that twice, I'd say, in the last decade. I don't remember the particulars. I think it was psychotic patients in emergency settings where there was a little bit of danger involved. Um, but that's about it. Um, I, I'm going to finish in probably 90 seconds. Um, I'll say this about certainty. Uh, physicians in general, healthcare prof professionals in general, we really like certainty. Our teachers do not like it if we say we don't have the answer. And so we are really pushed hard to get the right answer. Um, I actually wrote a paper, my first published paper in the medical peer-reviewed literature is in 1991, runner-up student paper in the Pharos um, about certainty in medicine. I have reprints, so <laughs> <laughs> I know you're going to be burning down house for this. Um, uh, but it talked about the extent to which uh, medicine really strives for certainty, and the fact is we often can't get it. Um, even when we think we have a diagnosis for certain, there can be issues around the edges. This may not be one of them, but I want to put out here that we like certainty, and we also, as we heard, we like efficiency. Um, but sometimes, uh, respecting patients' rights needs to be prioritized over those two things. So in conclusion, apart from practical concerns about both the need for and the efficacy of deception and the use of placebo, Deceiving patients is wrong. It violates their autonomy and sets a bad precedent for physicians themselves and for medicine in general. And I'll stop there. Ooh, ooh, can I respond, please? <laughs> uh, okay, I, well, uh, I want to get the audience involved as much as we possibly can, but everybody, so if you want to take the first I'm not a psychiatrist, I spent about 12 seconds. <laughs> so, the... I, I will respond only to two points, the anger and the efficacy. The anger is a good point, but irrelevant, because they are equally anger with the diagnosis of psychogenic seizures without an induction. And every one of us who takes care of these patients all the time knows this. So the induction might add 5% of, of anger. So the anger is there with the diagnosis, not so much with the induction. It might add a little bit, I'll grant you that. And then the issue about the efficacy, let's go back to your patient, Miss W. Okay, it's been two days, I don't have a diagnosis. If I do an activation induction, not saline, your points are all valid for the saline. We, we both agree on that. But they're also completely invalid if you eliminate the saline, if we just do high HV and photic stimulation, then most of your arguments don't hold. Anyway, going back to Ms. W. I do an activation with hyperventilation, photic stimulation, verbal suggestion. There are three possible outcomes, none of which to me are harmful. So to say that 30% of the time it doesn't work, that is true, we know that. So we do an activation on her, it produces nothing. What have we lost? You did hyperventilation, foot stimulation, a little bit of verbal coaching. What's the side effect? Okay, it's a negative. It's, it's a, we know the sensitivity isn't good. What is good is the specificity. If it induces an episode, it is psychogenic almost certainly. So now you can open the discussion. Who would do the induction on Ms. W? So, so um, 
I, I'm, I'm going to try and capture a tweet that we got from Paul Ford at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, who thinks about these issues a lot as well. Um, but it, this is partly a question of my own, which is uh, I'm going to describe a potential way of uh, inducing psychogenic seizures uh, without deception, or, or if there is deception involved, we'll call it authorized deception. So it's not clear to me why one couldn't discuss the admission for, for epilepsy monitoring ahead of time and talk in a very open way about the possibility of psychogenic seizures and, and epileptic seizures and, and tell patients that one of the things that we're going to try and do is figure out whether these are psychogenic or not. And in order to do that, I'm going to give you various maneuvers and maybe even medications and maybe even IV infusions. Um, and you're not always going to know which they are, uh, and is that okay with you? <coughs> now, what I, I, I think doing it like that, if that worked, would, uh, would at least reduce and maybe eliminate most of the concerns about deception. Um, but first I'm curious about whether people's intuition is that that would work or not work. Uh, would, would removing, you know, would, would we be eliminating too much of the suggestion that this is going to work by authorizing the deception. And Barbara, do you mind? I'd like to comment on that because I was back in the day when we did, you know, when placebo injections were done and I worked for Ed Bromfield and he felt it was deceptive, he'd never do it and uh, they worked much better and nowadays we do, still do them, rarely. Um, I do explain before they come in, I think that you have psychogenic seizures, this is, I do it like you say it and it really, I have to say, I don't think it works nearly as well. So I'm not getting that rate. I, I don't, when did you see them? So have you seen a, our rate of inducing a typical event using our hyperventilation? It's not nearly as good. I not think nearly as what the literature says. <coughs> and we're more, I'm very direct and honest, and I, I tell my patients I'm going to tell you the truth. So I, I don't feel that deceptive feeling. I think we haven't done it that often. But, you know, your points, I listened to both of your points, and I'm like right in there. Um, I don't think we should be deceptive to patients because the one time I remember, it stands out in my mind, it's probably over 10 years ago, that I was able to get a typical event with an induction, and it may have been hyperventilation. Uh, the patient was upset afterwards, and she said, well, that was, you know, you, you, I've never had one induced before, that's not my typical, typical event, even though the family agreed it was a typical event. So it's, it's interesting. I think that we're not as successful when we're completely Open, which yeah, is but, what I think. but you went a little further than you mentioned because you, you you said the word psychogenic seizures from the get go. What you're proposing, which I totally agree with, is that you say we go with an open mind. I don't know what your spells are. We're going to do some activation procedures to try to trigger something uh, with an open. Whereas you're right, if if you suggest uh, that this may be psychogenic, then the yield might go down. I don't know that for a fact, but Susan, you do. Yeah. So so my problem with this is just going in this with the idea that this is deceptive and i challenge anyone in this room to say that you can say with 100 percent certainty that you know what the diagnosis is before you record the spells and so if we do go into this with an open mind that we don't know for, you know why would we be doing the video eeg monitoring if we knew what the patient already had so yes sometimes we highly suspect that the episodes are psychogenic but even in those patients we may be surprised that they also have epileptic seizures. And so if we truly go into this with an open mind, that we are going to take a fresh look, your comments about these patients having been uh, abused, not just by their trauma um, in the past, but by the medical profession in many cases, they're often treated very poorly and um, their complaints are minimized. They come and, and you open, you, you know, you sort of say, I'm gonna take a fresh look. And I tell the patients in the clinic before I even bring them in the hospital, there are a bunch of things that can look like seizures. And I don't know which one of them you have, but they're certainly not responding to seizure medications. But let's bring you in. We're gonna do this, this, and this. We have protocols that are set up that patients, you know, get hyperventilation, get photic stimulation if they haven't had an event by a specific time. And so the idea that you're and that's all patients, whether you think they have epilepsy or non-epileptic events, everyone gets the same induction. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you walk in the room and you say, all right, in this five minute period, I'm gonna do something and expect you to have an event. You make rounds and you say, okay, today's hyperventilation day. You feel up for that? Good, you were sleep deprived last night. You're much more likely to have an episode today. And then you leave. 
and the tech comes in and they do the hyperventilation. I don't see that as deceptive. I do that for my epilepsy patients and my non-epilepsy patients, or patients who I suspect to have epilepsy versus non-epileptic events. Um, so, so going into this the, with the idea that we're deceiving presupposes that we already know what they have, which is a big issue. Or that we're morally compelled to say everything we're thinking at the moment. I mean, you can be thinking it, but I mean, you're not sure. Tell them when you, when you know that. But you do agree that with IV, there is deception. Uh, absolutely. Okay. And okay. I would think never, that's yeah, pretty I much a consensus. There is so, so I'm, I'm very curious if anybody in the room, so, so I think a lot of epileptologists, and I'm curious if you would agree with this, are, are comfortable with hyperventilation and photic stimulation and sleep deprivation. And the reason that I think we are comfortable with those maneuvers is that you know, th these are things that, in theory, provoke both epileptic seizures and psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. And, we, and when, when we present, present them, we present them in that way. We say, you know, these, uh, these maneuvers that we're doing are, are known to trigger both epileptic seizures and psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. And we're going to try it with you and see uh, what, what it produces. And uh, I don't find that deceptive. Given um, that all three of those <coughs> modalities can bring about seizures, I have no problem with that at all. And, and so... And that, and, 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 that's and, running a test. <coughs> well... I don't think it's totally simple because I think oftentimes we go into those maneuvers with a suspicion of, of what it is, and I think we're maybe we might do them a little more aggressively. We might put a little more flair into our performance when we suspect PNES. And I, I mean, I, I don't think that's nothing. I think there is a little bit of deceptiveness, but I think most epileptologists, certainly, I feel comfortable with that level of minimal deception. I'm curious if, if you, it sounds like you don't really. See I don't that. hear the question. Um, okay, maybe we can take another question. As far as I'm concerned, psychogenic non-epileptic. Actually, could I ask everybody to speak very loudly because the people watching by a web stream have to hear through that mic. As far as I'm concerned, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures are one of a variety of paroxysmal movement disorders with or without association or loss of consciousness. Now is whatever you're des describing, which, you know, doing photic simulation or hyperventilation, right, I mean, there are certain seizures that are triggered by photic stimulation. If you were to say, this can trigger uh, various different seizure types, then you're, you're, you're saying what you're doing, you know, because then you can open Pandora's box. Is anything you're doing in the clinic then therefore deception when you're enlisting a functional sign, entrainment of a tremor? Um, a resolution of something else with distraction, a Hoover's maneuver, uh, using a tuning fork to te test for midline splitting sensory loss. Is that not a deception? And then, you know, and you know, there are even more radical ways you could say, wait a minute, this clearly is a deception, where, you know, from what you're describing, that's not really a placebo response. That's a bit of suggestion that some types of seizures can do this. But there are other people who would advocate, and it's in their literature, for instance, using very low dose Botox in the setting of functional dystonia, and some some patients with a placebo response have complete resolution of a fixed dystonia. I mean, if you're talking about deception, that really is deception because you're using a non-therapeutic dose of Botox for, you know, a, a, you know, as as a form through start seeing if that will resolve what you think is a is a functional fixed dystonia. But in non epileptic seizures, I don't really, you know. It, it brings into the whole question of, in terms of the whole diagnosis process of any functional neurological disorder if you're saying that uh, that, that is deception because that's inherent in the way that you diagnose them. Great. Somebody, somebody did make that point. I think it was Ron Lesser many years ago that it is similar to not that different from a Hoover maneuver and a tuning fork <coughs> and the, the, black, the mirror for diplopia. Hi. I'm a neurologist, <clears throat> but when I went into the army, they decided they needed psychiatrists. So I was a psychiatrist with one year, one month's medical school behind me. I was assigned to a locked unit. This is before lithium, before just Thorazine just came out, and we had two triptylenes. And there I am in this ward, and with full of really disturbed people. And what to do? Guess what I did? I got some paint, brushes, and I had the patients paint the ward. Then it was seasonal, so I had them plant a garden. 
and then they started their own newspaper. It, it was instinctive to me that I had to en enhance their sense of their own self-worth, no matter what was wrong with them. And that was my, my first introduction to psychiatry at a point. I almost changed fields, but by then I had four children and couldn't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> so I have four children and can't afford it. I have five children. <laughs> but the checks are clear. <laughs> I, I have probably, I have so much experience with functional disorders. So I'm in the emergency room at Metro West, and I'm feeling, hey, I really know all this stuff. I've been through the army and all that. And there's this guy who's having obvious conversion and seizure. And I stupidly said, if this doesn't stop within the next few minutes, we're going to have to do one of these painful spinal taps. Then the guy stopped seizing, jumped up, and shouted, you bastard, you don't believe me. And he ran after me. Mm. That stopped the seizure. <laughs> now, that, you know, this was before I had any idea about ethics. I mean, that was that was really a very bad thing to do. And uh, I, I, but I was naive and full of uh, unreasonable confidence. So I, so I, one day, uh, a I've got a call. There's a there's a there's, there's a woman who is in a coma, and I recognize her name and I knew it was pseudocoma, I, mean, I was pretty sure. It turned out it was. And here's a woman that was suspected of having, uh, te quote, temporal lobe seizures. It went to the point of somebody found something wrong in an MR and they did a brain operation and removed an un unnecessary part of the temporal lobe and she wound up having epileptic seizures. Fast forward, she comes, uh, she comes to see me and uh, she ha she's got a left hemiplegia. She got into a motor vehicle accident, and the ER doc says, you're going to feel worse before you feel better. So she wasn't moving her left arm for the longest time, and I, uh, and she was, she deteriorated, she was in the hospital, and I was asked to see her, and I, by that time, had learned how to stock a conversion symptom without sodium amytol. We used to use sodium amytol all the time. One day I said, I don't need any of this. All I have to do is get myself in the frame of mind that this person will recover, no doubt, and you know, I could get over most of the symptoms. One day I did it, and make a long story short, the person killed themselves because I hadn't thought through the significance of a relief of a symptom that they needed in their life. They needed this symptom. You know, this is, this is acknowledging errors, you know, 40, 50 years ago. So there's this woman in the unit, and I know that it can be wrong to relieve. What, what do I do? I couldn't convince any psychiatry department in Boston. Every, I called every place. Will you take this lady? I know this guy, this woman has a conversion problem. Can you, can you see a way to helping her? Nobody, nobody would take her. And in a frustrated, I went into the unit, closed the door, and, and 15 minutes later, her left hemiparis is cleared with suggestion. And then I said, please don't discharge her. Now that she's recovered, she could do harm to herself. And they discharged her anyway. I saw her later, she was okay. <laughs> so there's danger in relieving symptoms. There's a reason why these people have symptoms. And in the real world, psychiatrists, understandably, don't want to take the responsibility. Neurologists don't want to take the responsibility. What you need is to find people who are trained and certified, or at least trained in both fields, to take the responsibility and take and take charge of these patients whenever possible. You know, I'm comfortable in that because I have the experience, but most people <coughs> wouldn't be. And uh, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Uh, sure. Yeah, uh, this is more. Uh, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a, 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 a neurologist. Um, so I want to say I admired uh, Dr. Ben Bass's ben 
that's his, um, saying, listen, we need, there are some situations that we would be able to do much better diagnosis if we use deception, the extreme form of giving saline injection. I admire you being able to say that publicly. I also admire that you're in the trenches and you're in the real world. But I, I, what I feel is that you're asking for a dispensation that you feel is very legitimate. And I can understand your argument. But actually, physicians are using that dispensation all over the place. And we give you the dispensation to lie to patients. We're endorsing the dispensation. We know, for example, a, 19, a 2008 survey published in BMJ, Gilbert first author, that in the United States, 50, uh, it was a national randomized survey of 1,000 physicians, half were or internists and half rheumatologists were asked, do you ever give anything to the patient that, pure, that you suggest is actually an active medication that you give for psychological purposes? And the answer was 50% of those patients, uh, those physicians were giving placebos, most, not, not necessarily saline or sugar pills, but actually medications that were sub, uh, dosage that had no effect on their, uh, on their, on their patient's symptomatology and complaints. The thing about the dispensation that you're saying to me is I really understand your um, anguish to help your patients. I really feel it. I know I, those things are incredible. But the whole profession is at stake here. And frankly, too many physicians want dispensation to lie. We know the medical profession doesn't have a great history around this. And I think the idea of transparency and respect for person trumps beneficence in every situation. You're confusing the placebo effect, which is very real from deception. I mean, if you look at the treatment of my, I'm an epileptologist, but if you look at the treatment of migraine, the active treatments we use don't do any better than placebo. So placebo is a very real effect. Uh, and I don't see how it's deceiving to give someone something that you think is working by placebo effect, as opposed to by an active biological effect. In fact, I'd like to ask if you think, any of you think it's ethical, to stop a one of those seizures by giving IV saline. Now that patient's liable to get IV out of an anyway. Is there really anything wrong with giving IV saline first to see if that stops the seizure to help confirm a diagnosis of pseudo seizure? So, and Dr. Benjamin, there, there, you had a slide that mentioned was, stopping. It was it. mentioned All briefly. Actually, asked the same question yes. about it. It was mentioned briefly as a rare instance in which we will use IV saline, and that is to relieve the patient when the, the, the pseudo seizures you saw these uh, convulsive psychogenic seizures when they go on for 20, 30 minutes, an hour, and uh, it becomes necessary to stop them to relieve the patient, but also the nursing staff, uh, who becomes increasingly agitated. So we will use it in that setting, and that touches a little bit on what you said, because now it becomes a treatment. So this is one of the rare few cases where we will resort to IV placebo. Yes, I don't love it, but, and again, as I said before, not only does it stop the thing, if it does, and if it doesn't, there is no harm, but if it does, it adds a diagnostic argument, once again, and the diagnosis can be difficult. Yeah, going back to your point, and I'm glad you, you mentioned Mexico, because I'm originally trained there in Mexico. So first, I, I wouldn't call placebo induction. It would be a nocebo induction, because we are performing something that we can <laughs> We do a lot of placebo treatment later on, and especially in those long uh, seizures, that will actually assure us the, the diagnosis. And especially in a public hospital, where we don't have too much access to the video monitoring units, right. because they, we give priorities, and then we move to the utilitarian philosophical point of view. And it actually kind of works. Yeah, you, 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 here we have the luxury that we can worry about uh, philosophical concerns. And it's sure, but in, in other places where you can do EEG video, sometimes that's your best diagnostic methods, including for non-seizure symptoms, right. movement disorders you mentioned, or other psychogenic symptoms. Sometimes the placebo maneuver, or nocebo as you correctly point out, is your best diagnosis method. They don't have EEG video. Here in America, we can worry about fibromyalgia and philosophical problems. In other parts of the world, they can. So one, one of the, uh, have you got one? Question, please. Um, does PDS ever occur while the patient is sleeping? And if it does, does it have any similarity to other psychiatric conditions which might occur during the sleeping state? So, so it, it occurs from apparent sleep, where the patient looks asleep to you know, a casual observer, um, but not uh, 
EEG sleep. So one of the things you're doing in, in the, in the uh, EMU and the MLT monitoring unit is you're, you're looking uh, to see if the events do begin during apparent sleep. Are the patients actually asleep or are you, are you having a slow wave sleep or a rhythm sleep uh, when the <coughs> seizure begins? Or are they actually waking up um, and, and then producing the event? I just wanted to make one other comment. I was surprised that you didn't talk at all about um, the utility of this and engaging patients in therapy. And um, so I will often, if somebody has an event that is brought on by some type of a suggestion, that I will say, you know, clearly there's something that's in control of this. It's not you. This is you're not faking it. But there is the ability to influence this from external factors. And so if we can identify what those factors are in your day-to-day -day life, that may actually help to get control of this. Because it's very, very hard to get patients to actually go and seek out the psychiatric care. It's even harder to find it once they agree. But to get the patients to be willing to engage in CBT or whatever um, uh, uh, psychotherapy psychiatrist or, or psychotherapist works with. So is that something that you find useful or? I admire you for doing this. I think you are playing psychiatrist. <laughs> and I don't want to play psychiatrist because I want psychiatrists to do their job. But are you, are you talking, you're talking about referring to psychiatric care, not right, doing to, psychiatric not, no, no, no. care. So, but you're so initiating the therapy. Right, initiate the, the you're venturing discussion. on psychiatric territory, shall we right. say. Because I, I think one of the biggest problems, I mean, and you railed quite vociferously <laughs> against psychiatrists, I would argue that we fail as neurologists because we make the diagnosis and we say, all right, bye-bye, go see your psychiatrist, and, you know, good luck. Don't bother me again. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think that having uh, a, a degree of overlap where we hand the patients over, make sure that they're in good hands, and give the patients a way to kind of fall back on the person who made the original diagnosis is incredibly important. And I don't think we do a good enough job of that. No, I, I, I'll, yeah. s I'll <laughs> say in my practice at Cambridge Health Alliance, I work uh, very closely with primary care docs. Uh, and that's the one who referred the most recent uh, case, woman with PMDS. Uh, to me, I work closely with them. I also work, work closely with neurologists so much so that I have at least two of their cell phone uh, numbers <laughs> in my cell phone, and it, you know we we collaborate closely. So. I agree, but I still would like people to tell me to answer this very simple question that I brought up: Is the hiding of the mental health professions an oversight, or is it a deliberate avoidance? Or am I wrong and it's neither, but please enlighten me. Why are there no patient information material on the APA website? Why do they not do research on somatoform, somatization, and all this? Disorder? How much money is there in researching PMS? As far as I'm concerned, money drives the APA I don't know. and research uh, to a very large extent. What about the patient education? It doesn't cost money. <laughs> As always, we are just getting going. We had some, some, some from that side. Well, we, we, so the people that are here have the opportunity to continue the discussion upstairs with food. Um, but is there beer? Is, there is no beer. We, you know, if we go past <laughs> this thing, we can, kind of we can somehow it? arrange to find it. Um, <laughs> I need a beer. And so we do have to turn loose our uh, the people watching us by a webcast, uh, and we will be convening in room 447 upstairs. There are Excellent. Elevators across the <laughs> Thank you.